Hi, this is Madison Stanford and Mike Welch. For our E25 Extra Credit Project, we interviewed Dr. Jim Schwartz, a professor of chemical engineering and bioengineering here at Stanford. He told us about his lab's work in cell-free protein synthesis and its applications in alternative energy and vaccine development. In Engineering 25, we learned how cells have enzymes which transcribe DNA into RNA, then translate RNA into proteins. Your lab has become proficient at cell-free protein synthesis. How does this work? Well, basically it works exactly the same way it works in the cell. So we use similar enzymes. We certainly use ribosomes and all those support enzymes, transfer RNAs, and so on. And in fact, we've also activated a variety of other metabolic pathways to supply energy so that the system can be inexpensive as well as long-lived. What are the advantages of cell-free protein synthesis? It really allows you to have control over those reactions that typically we don't have access to. So we don't have a cell wall in the way. So we can add things to the reaction, and we can change the pH, for example, or other conditions. We can even inactivate certain things. So we really have much more power to modulate and control the reactions leading to properly folded proteins. What energy source do you use for your cell-free system? Well, we have several. We can use a high-energy compound called phosphoenolpyruvate. Uh, but we also have activated the same process that the cells use when they transfer electrons from a carbon source of fuel such as glucose to oxygen called oxidative phosphorylation and this is a very inexpensive as well as a prolific source of energy. Did your lab encounter any difficulties in getting the proteins made by cell-free protein synthesis to fold correctly? Uh, yes, we certainly did, especially for proteins that were more complex. For example, proteins that require disulfide bonds were especially difficult early on. And for that to work, we had to inactivate a couple enzymes that were in the cell extract. We then added chemicals that poised the redox potential at the proper place for disulfide bond formation. And then we also added a special enzyme that causes the disulfide bonds to rearrange in case they form improperly initially. Then we have a chance to find the correct partners. And all three of those things were required for that to work. Dr. Schwartz's lab prepares a cell extract for protein synthesis by first growing E. coli cells and washing away the spent growth medium. They then use high pressure homogenization to break the cells apart. They centrifuge the mixture to remove the cell wall and much of the chromosomal DNA. And finally, they add a DNA template, nucleotide triphosphates, an energy source like phosphoenolpyruvate or glucose, and other factors that make protein production possible without intact cells. What are some potential applications of this cell-free protein synthesis framework that your laboratory has developed? Well, first of all, we can use it as an effective research tool. For example, we're using it to evolve an enzyme called a hydrogenase to be oxygen tolerant. And we want to do that because such an enzyme could be used in an organism to take sunlight and make hydrogen as a fuel. And we currently can't do that because we don't have such an enzyme. It's somewhat difficult to achieve, but we've made good progress and we believe that it's possible. On the other end, we're using technology for producing novel new vaccines. We are planning to use it for producing cancer diagnostics. And we are also using it to make pharmaceutical proteins, such as interleukin-2, interleukin-4, which can be used to treat disease. So, if we're correct, one of the types of vac vaccine applications you were talking about involves something called virus-like particles. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about these? Yeah, that's correct, and that's the primary focus for the improved vaccines. So they are very much like real viruses, except they have no nucleic acid, or at least no functional nucleic acid on the inside, so that they're totally non-infectious. And yet, because they're very much like real viruses, they are conveyed to lymph nodes, 
and they are effective in setting up and stimulating immune responses. And so what we do is we stick specific proteins to the outside of the virus-like particle um, to which we want immune responses to those proteins that we attach. And we can also attach the lymphokines I just mentioned, interleukin-2, for example, to stimulate an even stronger immune response. And so then you use cell-free protein synthesis to make the proteins that make up these vaccines, is that right? Yeah, so it's pretty remarkable. It's actually pretty cool because we can express a single small protein and 180 copies of that protein will assemble into this particle, into this virus-like particle. And that particle becomes very stable and we can purify it easily from that mixture and then add things to it. Okay. Yeah. That sounds great. Well, thank you very much for your time. Oh, you're Appreciate welcome. it. Yep. After adding the necessary factors for protein synthesis to the E. coli-based lysate, Dr. Schwartz's lab uses this system to make a simple protein. 180 copies of this protein then self-assemble to form a virus-like particle. They also use cell-free protein synthesis to make protein ligands which can stimulate an appropriate immune response in the body. They attach these ligands to the proteins comprising the virus-like particle to complete the assembly process. The final product is an effective vaccine because it stimulates the same immune response that a natural virus does without the threat of infection. We'd like to thank Dr. Schwartz again for taking the time to share his fascinating research with us. We hope you enjoyed our video.